I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 61. Originally, I had anticipated uh, returning to the series that uh, is underway in the Canons of Dort. Uh, But reflecting on the Lord's uh, providential working uh, during the week and the difficult week that it's been, I thought that it would be fitting and, uh, I hope, edifying uh, to turn instead uh, to consider a psalm. And so I've chosen Psalm 61, a psalm that uh, perhaps you're familiar with, uh, or perhaps because I'm here you're growing familiar with it. It makes its appearance from time to time in emails. And it is a psalm uh, that gives us a guide, really, for what to do when we don't know what to do, what to do when our world is turned upside down. So give attention then to God's word as it comes to us from Psalm 61. For the director of music with stringed instruments of David. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you, I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings, Selah. For you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then will I ever sing praise to your name and fulfill my vows day after day. Uh, There ends the reading of God's word, and may he uh, bless it as we consider it this evening. A dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know that there are many experiences that feel as as scary and as uh, threatening as uh, when you are pushed under the water. And you're pushed under long enough that the, the oxygen reserves in your lungs begin to expire and there is this feeling of full body panic. And I suspect that many of you have experienced that. Um, wh- whether at the hands of a brother or sister, you know, they're always kind and ready to um, help us. Um, at the hands of a friend, uh, likewise, uh, always eager to be of, of service. Uh, as you're playing in the pool, or maybe uh, simply at the shore as the waves are big and you feel yourself uh, engulfed in the waves and press down and you begin to panic. And I believe that that's a helpful image. That's the image that comes to my mind every time that I read verses uh, 1 through 3 of Psalm 61. Uh, Because uh, though the psalmist, the, the experience in which the psalmist finds himself is very different Uh, than that of being trapped underwater, the effect that it produces is roughly the same. Of panic, of fear, of doubt, of perhaps impending uh, disaster or even impending death. And and, uh, we find David in Psalm 61, it seems uh, removed far from the temple, removed far from uh, home, removed far from God's people. We find him pressed, pressed to the point that he is fainting, or as uh, the New King James Version renders it, that he is overwhelmed, head under water, running out of air, wondering how much longer he can actually last in this situation. And what he models for us in the midst of this situation of desperation is at the very heart of the life of faith. What he models for us is is what it is to reach out and to cling to the Lord our God for very life. 
to hold on to him, to cry out to him, to rest in him. Uh, so I've entitled uh, this evening's sermon, A Refuge uh, for the Ravaged or A Refuge for the Overwhelmed. Uh, for that is what the psalmist is seeking in Psalm 61. And what we see in these verses is that the Lord is the temporal and eternal refuge of all those who seek him in their distress. The Lord is the refuge of all those who seek him in their distress. And we're going to look at just uh, two different uh, points that come to light in Psalm 61. Uh, first, in verses 1 through 4, we're going to consider the cry of an overwhelmed saint, the cry of an overwhelmed saint. And then secondly, in verses 5 through 8, we're going to consider the prayer of a consoled saint. The prayer of a consoled saint. So consider, first of all, the psalmist's cry as uh, it is for us in verses 1 through 4. Uh, we, we, we hear the heartache, right? We hear the, the sorrow, the grief uh, in, in his voice as we read verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. Uh, but he goes on to elaborate on this. He says, from the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, there's not a clear indication of uh, what the particular circumstances that David is facing are in this, uh, as he pens this psalm. Uh, but it seems that commentators, uh, old and not so old alike, tend to think that this happened during uh, David's banishment from Jerusalem by his own son, Absalom. As he was uh, driven out of the city, as he was uh, driven across the brook, as he was driven away from the temple of God, that, that place that symbolized the dwelling of God with his people, as he was uh, rejected and betrayed by his own son and by his closest friend and counselor, Ahithophel, he feels abandoned. He feels desperate. And he feels driven out. It is no wonder then that he says, from the ends of the earth I call to you. It doesn't really matter, right, for the child of God how far he or she is from that place of uh, that visible representation of God's dwelling with his people. Uh, for, for David, uh, for the sweet psalmist of Israel to be separated from the tabernacle, to be separated from its services, to be separated from uh, the, the pictures that are offered there, the, the types that are being uh, displayed there every day, it is as if he has been banished to the very ends of the earth. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. Now, I suspect that many of us know a little bit about what it is to cry to the Lord from the ends of the earth maybe from the comfort of our own home. But for all intents and purposes, the comfort of our own home, the comfort of this church building, the comfort of uh, the home of family and friends may as well be the very ends of the earth when tragedy, distress, anxiety finds us. When we find ourselves caught up in the billows, the waves that the psalmist describes in Psalm 42, we find ourselves drowning. We find ourselves sinking. We find ourselves sometimes uh, so grieved, so overwhelmed, that we can hardly put words together in a coherent strand of thought. We go to the Lord. Uh, we want to cry out to him, but the words of a prayer will hardly even form on our lips. Have you been there? It's a dark place. It's a difficult place. It's a place that nobody actually ever asks to go to. And none of us wants to go there. None of us would ever purchase a ticket to fly there. We want to be as far from there as possible. And, and so it is that the psalmist 
calls, he, uh, as he, the, the tense of the word here in, in verse 2, the tense of the verb call implies that this is a repetitive thing. Lord, Lord, I, I know that I've been once, I've been twice, I've been ten times, I've been a hundred times. But so long as he feels himself to be at the ends of the earth, so long as he feels himself caught up in the billows of, of the, the tragedy and the difficulty of life, the grief that life can bring, so often does he call out to the Lord. He says, I call as my heart grows faint. Here you, you find a man that, that as it were, you th think of how you feel uh, when you go without food for uh, one meal or, or perhaps two meals. Now, the noble family is uh, reputed for being hangry people. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. Um, hangry people at one and the same time are the most difficult people to live with and the easiest people to live with. They're very difficult when they don't have food, but all that you have to do to satisfy them is throw them a piece of bread, and suddenly they're healed. Well, the psalmist he, he, he describes his experience in terms of growing faint. He doesn't have water. He doesn't have the food. He doesn't have the, that, that which is necessary to sustain his life. Alternatively, this, this word could be used to describe uh, closed up and covered over, sealed up in an envelope, as if the, the waves have come up over top of him. And what kind of a prayer forms on the lips at that point in time? Lord, save me. Lord, have mercy. It is a simple prayer. It is a prayer of desperation. And he recognizes his personal weakness. That's what happens, right? When we experience the difficulties of life, it has a way of humbling us. Because there are so many things that we are absolutely powerless to change. We are powerless to do anything about them, power, powerless to alleviate the suffering, powerless to alleviate our own grief or the grief of those that are near and dear to us. We're powerless. Well, the psalmist, he felt this powerlessness on this occasion, and what it did is it led him to cry out to God. It led him to call and to call and to call again. A Spurgeon says this, it is hard to pray when the very heart is drowning. Yet gracious men pray best at such times. Trib tribulation brings us to God and brings God to us. Now that's a beautiful statement. And, and, and this, is, this is the lived experience of God's people. That, that as difficult as the tribulations that we experience are, as, as immense as the pain that we may experience in this world can be, that there is a, a, a sweetness in our experience of God and in our experience of his comfort during those times. Now, that's not, the, that, that's not across the board, right? There are ups and downs in the experience of every child of God. And, and not every grieving person or afflicted person feels equally at all times that God is right here. God is with me. God is walking through the fire with me. Uh, and he is passing through the waters with me. We do not feel that all the time. But there is a precious way in which God reveals himself to those who are afflicted. While this experience what it did for David and, and what it does for the child of God when we become overwhelmed is that it reveals the insufficiency of every earthly security. Uh, because there are so many things that money can't touch, money can't buy. For, for all of the, the gadgets and the toys and the mansions and the cars and you name it, uh, that, that money can buy, it can't bring peace to a grieving heart. It cannot bring, uh, bring uh, stability to a family that is spiritually torn apart. It is powerless. And friends and family, uh, we discover their weaknesses as well at that point in time because so many things, that we're, whereas our friends and our family, we say they're with us through thick and, and thin, 
There are places where family cannot go, places where family does not go. And, and so any security that we have lodged in our family, any security that we have lodged in any of the things of earth, ultimately, it will disappoint us. And in the midst of grief, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of tribulation, we find that there is only one place where security may be found. The psalmist was reminded of this. He, he says at the end of verse 2, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Here again, the image of a drowning man is helpful. A drowning man as he draws close to, to a, a rocky shore. And there are all of these, these rocks, 10 foot tall rocks, 12 foot tall rocks. And, and as he is drowning and, and his head comes up above and he sees these rocks, he thinks to himself, if only I could get up on top of there, I would be safe. But it's hard enough getting out of the swimming pool when you're weighed down, let alone getting on top of those high rocks. He says, Lord, you are this high rock. You are the rock that is higher than I. Uh, but th there is this, this cry to lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Not simply be the rock that is higher than I, but, but lead me to this place. Bring me to this place. Shelter me here. And, and again, the, the tense of the verb lead, uh, similar to the, the, the verb call, has this repetitive sense to it. And this is good advice for people who are struggling with affliction. This is a good example for those who are weighed down with grief because grief is extremely unpredictable. One moment you may feel like you're drowning and then the wave passes. Your head comes up above water and for a minute you believe and maybe for a little while you believe that life is actually going to be okay and, and that I'm actually maybe be going to be able to eke out some kind of a normal existence again. Here comes the next wave. And again and again and again. The psalmist, he keeps going back. I need to be on that rock. Get me on that rock. Lead me back to that rock. Lead me back to that rock when I have these unanswerable questions. Lead me back to this rock w w when I'm so grieved that I can't even think straight. When my mind turns in upon itself. Lead me to that rock when I'm numb. And nothing in life brings joy anymore. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, while we see that this prayer is, uh, is motivated by the fact that the psalmist has experienced the grace of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord in the past. Look at verse 3. He says, For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. Why is it that he goes to the Lord? It is because again and again, the Lord has shown himself to be faithful to David. Uh, if, if we are correct in uh, assuming that this is during uh, this, uh, Absalom's, uh, the period of Absalom's treachery, think about the track record that, that God has built up with David. Right? He takes him from the sheepfold. He uh, equips him with the courage and the strength to slay this giant before whom the whole army of Israel quakes. And then uh, he becomes a close friend and companion of Saul, uh, only to have Saul turn on him and begin to hunt him for years on end. Embittered, jealous, turned against David, who has only ever been faithful to him. And yet again and again, the Lord has delivered David. Not once, but twice, David came in within a hair's breadth of Saul, so much so that he could clip off the corner of his garment. And yet in those situations, the Lord delivered David. He upheld his anointed. He upheld his beloved servant. And so it is that David now, finding himself again in this place of difficulty, goes back to the one who has always been a refuge for him. The one who has never forsaken him. And... Brothers and sisters, we have this, this same 
avenue open to us, don't we? You see, for, for, for the psalmist, he, he maybe argues from the lesser to the greater. If God helped me then, perhaps he will help me now. Maybe he reasons from the greater to the lesser. The Lord helped me in that situation. He'll definitely help me now. And, and we stand on the stable ground of the New Testament. And, and we always reason then from the greater to the lesser. How so? Because God has manifest his love and his concern for us, his care for us in sending his only begotten son into the world that he might be the propitiation for our sins. You see, this is the strong point from which, uh, we, uh, upon which we stand, the rock upon which we stand, the confidence that we ought to have to approach the Lord our God in prayer at any point in time. The, the, the confidence that we ought to have to, to reach out and to grab hold of this rock, because as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Are you bearing a burden tonight? Do you feel overwhelmed tonight? Do you find yourself caught out on the open sea and you don't know what to do? Turn to the Lord. Turn unto him in the certainty that all who turn unto him will be received. He will not see you out there on the open sea drowning and turn his back. That's not who our God is. Now, he may not come on the timeline that you want him to come, and he may not come with the thing that you want him to come with. He may not come and take the pain and the suffering away as much as you wish that they would be banished forever. But he will not watch you drown. He will be there. He will be by your side. He will put a rock under your feet. He will preserve you. Well, so it is, as David comes to the end of this, this cry that he makes a vow, he says, well, in, in, in the uh, NIV, it says, I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Now, that's, uh, that, that's a reasonable translation of uh, the verb uh, at the beginning of verse 4. But I believe the, the sense that the psalmist actually intends is that of personal commitment. I will dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. O oh Lord, my God, if you come to my aid, you can be guaranteed that I will serve you. O oh Lord, if you come to me again in my distress, I will be in your temple, your tabernacle, your tent. I will take up my abode there. The, the, the picture that he uh, uses here uh, with his words, it's hidden completely in the uh, English text, but it's beautiful because what the, the word dwell is actually sojourn. And there's this, whole, there's this whole theology of sojourning in the Old Testament, right? There's this whole theology of the alien. Uh, there were those who came out of the land of Egypt with God's people, who chose to, to put their lots with God's people rather than with the Egyptians. And there were though, anybody who came into the nation of Israel and who wanted to worship the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, was sure to find a place of rest and of refuge in Israel. They were to receive such people. And so it was that there were many at different points in Israelite history who sojourned in the land of promise, who sojourned among the, the people of God because they wanted to be where God was. And the psalmist uses that, that illustration. I want to sojourn. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to leave house and, and home and, and family and all of that behind, all that was familiar to me, all that I have come to grow uh, or uh, have become accustomed to, I'm willing to leave all of that to take up my dwelling in your tent. Because where you are, there I must be. So then this is the cry of an overwhelmed saint. And then we see a remarkable transition in verses 5 through 8. Uh, because we see now the prayer of a consoled saint. 
it seems uh, quite possible that Psalm 61 was written uh, at, uh, on two separate occasions. Uh, that there is uh, the, this first cry, this prayer that the psalmist records, but that he comes back and he adds to it after the Lord answers his prayer. And so it is, uh, first of all, that we see in this prayer in verses 5 through 8, this note of thanksgiving. For you have heard my vows, or we could translate this, indeed, you have heard my vows, O God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. What a blessed statement. But again, what a blessed example, right? Uh, because when the Lord comes to his aid, when the Lord heeds his call and comes to his rescue, David does not straightway forget what it is that he has promised or what it is that he has uh, prayed or, or what it is uh, that the Lord has done for him, but he actually comes back and he wants to record a note of thanksgiving. You, indeed, you have heard my vows Oh God, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Well, what is that heritage or that inheritance to which he refers? It is the blessing uh, of, of being uh, accounted among or named among the people of God, first of all. And, and so it was, right, when the Israelites came into the promised land, that there was an allotment, there was an inheritance that was set apart for each one of them. Uh, and that, that, that land could not permanently pass outside of the family, though for a period of time it might pass outside the family because of debt. There was a, a, a whole stipulation written into the law that it would continue to go back to the family because the, the picture there was that everyone among Israel had a permanent place in the promised land. That's the heritage, the inheritance that God gives to his people. Of course, in, in New Testament terms, this doesn't take on uh, the form of a particular plot of land, though each of us may enjoy our own vine and our own fig tree and a nice little half acre somewhere. But the blessing ultimately pictured here, the deeper reality to which the psalmist alludes is a place among the people of God, a permanent place among the people of God, and God, to have God as his own God. To be, again, restored to that place uh, of, of dwelling where God is. Well, so this uh, prayer then moves from thanksgiving to petition. And, and if you're like me, you, you get to verses 6 and 7 and you think, okay, now this just doesn't seem to fit. Like, what do you make with 6 and 7? Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Uh, it seems like an, uh, a, a very abrupt transition in some way from verses, uh, verse 5 to verses 6 and seven. But what the psalmist here is doing is he's actually making a petition for the Israelite monarchy. Now, this is David, right? And David himself is the king of Israel. And so this, uh, this prayer applies uh, to his own life. Uh, it is as if he says in verse six, increase the days of my life, my years for many generations. But you see, Clearly that David is looking at something different, something greater, someone greater than himself. Uh, for David does not have some kind of expectation that he's going to have an unending uh, life upon the earth. Uh, his expectation, there's no indication in the word of God anywhere that David expects to live longer than any average human being at that point in time. But what he does have and what he does know is the promise that the Lord has made to him concerning his family. Well, for the Israelite mind, their welfare is tied up with their king. And, and we see this pattern, right? 
We see this pattern uh, playing out in the books of Kings and of Chronicles, that when there are good and godly kings, the nation thrives, and that when there are evil and wicked kings, the nation suffers. The, the welfare of the people is tied up with their government. The welfare of the people is tied up with their king. Uh, and, but ultimately, this is an insecure situation, right? Because uh, the, the pattern of the character of the kings of Israel is an up and down pattern. And even the best of the kings have major flaws. They have major shortcomings. But David expects a different king. He expects a better king. He expects a king who will not only be his son, but will be called God's son. The promise that God had made to him in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And he expects that one day a son who comes from his body, a son who is descended from his own family, will sit upon the throne eternally. Well, of course, this is Jesus Christ himself. The welfare of the people of God is tied up with the welfare of Christ. Now, that's a wonderfully promising fact. Because we don't have to wonder whether Christ is faithful we don't have to, to wonder whether Christ's future is secure. For as we talked about this morning, Christ came into the world. He did the work that the Father had entrusted to him, and he has been exalted at the right hand of the Father on high. The welfare of all those who trust in Christ is tied to him. This is important. And this is important especially for us when we're enduring affliction. When we're struggling. When the waves, the billows, they go above our heads. It is important to remember that our lives rest securely in Christ in heaven. That where he is, we will be. And do you see how David himself, he's following this line of progression, right? Uh, because he's using words that clearly indicate very long periods of time. Increase the days of the king's life, his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in God's presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. You see, he prays for himself, but as he prays for himself, he prays thinking of that one who will one day come from his own family, who will sit upon the throne everlastingly, that one in whom David's own welfare is eternally secure. And that one who makes his followers kings and priests unto God and his Father. Then we find him in verse 8, following through on the vow that he has made in verse 4. I will dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You see, David stakes up his position uh, in a manner of speaking in the house of the Lord. His only desire is to be ever in the presence of the Lord, no matter how humble the capacity may be in which he serves the Lord. Uh, give him water to carry. Give him wood to carry. Whatever the, the, the task may be, however menial it may be, he, he has staked his place in the house and in the service of God. And this takes the form in verse 8 of worship. Then will I ever sing praise to your name. My dear brothers and sisters, what you need to understand is this. 
that whatever you're going through right now, be the road ever so dark, be the water ever so deep, feeling as desperate as the situation may feel, and sometimes it feels very, very, very desperate. It's a moment-by-moment battle, right? This isn't a day-by-day battle, and this isn't a week-by-week or month-by-month battle, but it is one moment to the next. And sometimes it is all that we can do to put one foot in front of the other and to keep walking. It is all that we can do sometimes to not lay down and simply not rise again. But the Lord has a good purpose. He has a good purpose in his sovereign dispensation in your life, and you can trust him. I can't tell you precisely what that purpose is, but I can tell you where it leads, and it leads ultimately to the praise of God himself. Cry out to the Lord. Cling to him. As you suffer, as you struggle, as you can't even form words at time for prayer, reach out and grab hold of the rock that is higher than you. Cling to him. Confess your weakness to him. Ask him to hold you. He does that. Ask him to hold you near his side to keep you in that place of safety and that place of peace in the midst of the raging storm. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for your word and the way in which your word speaks to the various experiences of our lives. Ultimately, Lord, we acknowledge that you alone are capable of comforting us, and we pray that you would comfort those who mourn among us this evening that you would uh, strengthen those who are weighed down with heavy burdens, that you would lift the spirits and the minds of those who struggle with depression and anxiety, that you would help all of us as a body of Christ in Pompton Plains to cry out to you and to grab hold of the rock that is higher than us. Lord, lead us to that rock. Lead us again and again. We are so weak, we are so faint, For you are strong, and you are able to do all that is needed, and we thank you for that. Amen.